Hello students, coming to the next question, a patient presented to the ENT OPD with a complaint of vertigo. Okay, so here we have a patient of vertigo. There is no history of any hearing loss. The doctor performed a diagnostic maneuver which showed upbeating nystagmus to the right side. Upbeating to the right side. Okay, so what is the diagnostic maneuver and what is the diagnosis? What is the diagnosis and what is the diagnostic maneuver? Now, when we did the modules of inner ear also, what I told you is how you have to approach is that inner ear we know is for both hearing as well as balance. So, conditions of inner ear can either affect only the vestibular part, only the balance part or only the hearing part or both. So, we have to know them individually. Why? Because if the patient has come to you only with vertigo, like in this patient, patient has come to you only with vertigo, right? Nothing else is mentioned about the vertigo, only vertigo is mentioned. So, you should know that what are the things that you have to think about. If it was a patient who has come to you with hearing loss and vertigo, then you will think of something else. If it is a patient who has come to you only with hearing loss, which is a cochlear hearing loss, then you will think of something else. Yes. So, if it is a patient who has come to you only with vertigo, which part of the inner ear is involved? Yes. So, if there is involvement only vertigo, it can be involvement of only the semicircular canals. That can happen. So, if it is only vertigo, it can happen because of semicircular canal involvement, which is BPPV, right? Or it can be because of involvement of vestibular nerve, that is vestibular neuritis. Vestibular neuritis. So, in these two conditions, there is involvement of inner ear, but there is only vertigo because they are involving only the part which is responsible for balance. Is that clear? Now, if the patient presents with vertigo as well as hearing loss, okay, the patient has vertigo plus hearing loss. What hearing loss? Sensorineural, yes. Then what are the things that you will think of? So, if it is what I go with hearing loss, it means the whole of the inner ear is involved. Whole of the inner ear, for example, yes, it can be endolymphatic high drops. So, it can be meniers. It will involve the whole of the inner ear. It can be labyrinthitis. It can be labyrinthitis. It can be any fistula, fistula, perilymph fistula, fistula over the round window, over the oval window, over the lateral semicircular canal. Yes, so it can be fistula. In fistula, there is both pressure changes will lead to vertigo, there will also be hearing loss. Yes, or there can be superior semicircular canal dehiscence. There can be opening of fistula over the base of skull, which separates the inner ear from the base of skull, over the arcuate eminence, which is the bulge of the superior semicircular canal in the base of skull. So, that is superior semicircular canal dehiscence. Here also, it is just like a fistula. It is just that the fistula is where? In the roof of the inner ear. So, again, there will be pressure changes leading to vertigo. There will be hearing loss. Though the hearing loss here is conductive hearing loss as compared to rest. But yes, if the patient comes with vertigo, what your immediately your diagnosis is that it is involvement of inner ear. Yes. So, if there is vertigo along with hearing loss, then these are the things that you will think of. Yes, later on when you investigate, you will find out in superior semicircular canal, there will be a conductive hearing loss. But if the patient has vertigo, then you will keep superior semicircular canal uh, as also a DD in patients who come with vertigo as well as hearing loss, right? So now in this patient who has come to us, the patient has only one complaint and that is vertigo, okay? So there is no hearing loss. So now what comes to your mind? What is your DD? Tell me a differential diagnosis, only vertigo. Now, when we ask for differential diagnosis, you can make many differential diagnoses. You can say, okay, patient has vertigo, he can be BPPV, he can be vestibular neuritis, he can be meniers, labyrinthitis. Okay, you can make a lot of DD. But when you have to narrow down your DD, rule out, no, not this, not this, not this. So, let us suppose that we have ruled out everything. What in the end will be left when the patient has only vertigo? Yes, either it will be a BPPV or it will be a vestibular neuritis vestibular neuritis, right? Now, what is given more here is that the page, that the doctor performed a diagnostic maneuver. In which of these do we do a diagnostic maneuver to diagnose that it is uh, this condition? Yes, in BPPV, in BPPV, what happens in BPPV is that the 
autolith from the utricle goes into one of the semicircular canals. So, to find out whether it has gone into which semicircular canal, we go for a diagnostic maneuver. Yes, this diagnostic maneuver can be depending upon, it is different depending upon which semicircular canal we are testing. So, if it is the vertical canal, if it is the posterior semicircular canal, we go for the hall pike maneuver, Dix hall pike. And if it is a horizontal semicircular canal, we go for supine roll. So, this thing in the question that a diagnostic maneuver was done to find out uh, this cause of vertigo and on diagnostic maneuver there was nystagmus. So, this itself confirms that this is a patient of BPPV and the diagnostic maneuver is which maneuver? The diagnostic maneuver is a dix hall pike maneuver. So, what we do in the dix hall pike maneuver is that yes, we place the, we make the patient sit, we turn the head to the side that we are testing, the semicircular canal, the ear that we are testing and we, uh, we look for nystagmus when we change the position of the head of the patient. So, if nystagmus is present, we say that yes, this patient has this particular whichever semicircular canal we have tested whichever side we say this patient has right side posterior semicircular canal uh, or horizontal semicircular canal BPPV right. So, here in this patient the doctor has found up beating nystagmus to the right side there is up beating nystagmus to the right side. So, here what is asked is diagnostic maneuver diagnostic maneuver is Hallpike maneuver Diagnosis is BPPV. Okay, the next question is which is the canal and the ear involved? How can we find out that? Yes, by the nystagmus. By the nystagmus. Again, this is something that is very, very important. All of you should know that how by looking at the nystagmus, you can find out that what is the involvement in the ear, which area is involved, which semicircular canal is involved. Yes, so which is the canal and the ear involved? So, how do we do that? Yes, listen to this carefully. Now, whenever there is involvement of vertical canal, vertical canal, which are the vertical canal? The posterior semicircular canal and the superior semicircular canal, they are vertical canals. So, nystagmus is always in the plane of the canal that is involved. So, if it is a vertical canal involved, nystagmus will be vertical. Vertical means upbeating, upbeating, okay. And if it is a horizontal semicircular canal, that is the lateral semicircular canal involved, then the nystagmus will be horizontal. Yes, definitely in both of these, whenever the inner ear is involved, nystagmus of because of involvement of inner ear always whether it is vertical or whether it is horizontal always has a torsional component. There is a component of torsion also. It is a little torsional also, right. And so, this is clear. If there is a BPPV of posterior semicircular canal, nystagmus will be upbeating. If it is a BPPV of horizontal semicircular canal, nystagmus will be horizontal. Now, also when there is complete involvement of labyrinth like in labyrinthitis or in meniors, Whenever the involvement of the labyrinth is complete, whether it is hypoactive, whether it is hyperactive or in vestibular neuritis, when one nerve, one side nerve is completely gone, that leads to hypoactive one complete labyrinth. Yes, so that uh, in those conditions, whenever there is complete involvement of the labyrinth, nystagmus is always horizontal. Is that very clear? Nystagmus is always horizontal complete involvement. So, these are the things which you will never forget. Yes. In involvement of vertical canals, vertical nystagmus, horizontal canal, horizontal nystagmus, in complete involvement of labyrinth, nystagmus will always be horizontal. Why this occurs, the mechanism I have told you in the module of the vestibular function. You can go back to that and watch it if at all you've forgotten that. Now, quickly you will tell me the type of nystagmus, okay, vertical or horizontal. Posterior semicircular canal, BPPV. Posterior semicircular canal, vertical or horizontal? Yes, vertical. Anterior semicircular canal, that is superior semicircular canal, BPPV. Vertical or horizontal? Yes, that is a vertical canal, so vertical. Superior semicircular canal dehiscence. Superior semicircular canal dehiscence. Yes, that will lead to what I go. If there is nystagmus, it will be vertical or horizontal? Superior semicircular canal, vertical. Horizontal semicircular canal, BPPV, it will be horizontal. Lateral semicircular canal, fistula. Lateral semicircular canal is horizontal semicircular canal. Again, it will be horizontal. Caloric test. When you are doing the caloric test, what is the type of nystagmus that you get, vertical or horizontal? Again, this has been a question that has been asked. Yes, in fact, all this that I am doing has been questions that have been asked as fact-based questions that we are trying to understand here. Yes, caloric test stimulates which semicircular canal? The lateral semicircular canal, when you are putting water, different temperatures of water in the external artery canal, which is the semicircular canal which will uh, get stimulated by these changes of temperature? 
Yes, the one that bulges on the medial wall, that is the lateral semicircular canal. So, calvary test is because of the involvement or because of the stimulation of the lateral semicircular canal. So, that will lead to again horizontal nystagmus, vestibular neuritis. Yes, complete one nerve, vestibular nerve, one side nerve is gone. So, it is complete involvement. So, that is horizontal labyrinthitis. Labyrinthitis means complete labyrinth is involved. Horizontal meniors, again, it is endolymphatic hydro of the whole of the inner ear is involved. That is again horizontal. Is that clear? Yes. So, now if any of the condition is given, what type of nystagmus you know? Just by knowing whether it is involvement of the vertical or the horizontal or complete involvement. Is that clear? Okay. So, now coming to the direction. What is the direction? Direction always is the direction of the fast component. So, always remember that direction of nystagmus is always towards the most active side. What is the meaning of that? More active side means the lesion of, of the labyrinth can be either hyperactive lesion. Hyperactive, for example, BPPV. What is BPPV? The autolith is going to the semicircular canal, it is irritating it. So, that is the irritative or it is called as hyperactive lesion. Okay, or it can be hypoactive lesion. Hypoactive means complete destruction. Like labyrinthitis will lead to complete destruction. Vestibular neuritis will lead to complete destruction. Yes. Uh, so, if that is what is hypoactive. So, if one side is normal and the other side is hyperactive, one side is normal, other side is hypoactive. These are the two situations that we have. Either the labyrinth can be hyperactive or it can be hypoactive. So, nystagmus will be towards which side? Nystagmus is always towards the more active side. So, in, in this first, first case, nystagmus will be towards which side? Yes, towards the hyperactive side. In the second case, nystagmus will be towards which side? Towards the normal side. Nystagmus is always towards the more active side. Is that clear? More active side. So, if it is one side is hyperactive, it will be towards the more active. That is the hyperactive side. If one side is hypoactive, it will be towards the more active. That is the normal side. Is that clear? So, now, Direction of nystagmus, tell me, in right side, posterior semicircular canal, BPPV. Tell me exact what will be the nystagmus. Yes, posterior semicircular canal, so it will be vertical. Direction will be, this is a hyperactive or hypoactive. BPPV is hyperactive lesion. So, it will be towards the hyperactive side, more active side. So, it will be towards the right side. Vertical nystagmus towards the right side. Right, horizontal semicircular canal BPPV nystagmus will be horizontal and BPPV is a hyperactive lesion, so towards the right side. Right, vestibular neuritis. Are you also tell na, something? Yes, this you will tell me. Rest all the three you will tell me. Yes, vestibular neuritis, complete involvement, so horizontal. Which side? This is a hypoactive lesion, so nystagmus will be towards the normal side. This is right side. So, this will be towards the left side. Left will be the normal side. Is that clear? Labyrinthitis, again horizontal nystagmus. This is a hypoactive lesion. It will completely destroy the labyrinth of one side. So, nystagmus will be towards the normal side. This is right side, destruction, normal side. More active side is left side, left. Right, meniors. Now, meniors I just want to cut here. Yes, why? Because this is, meniors initially is a hyperactive lesion. When all the rupture, mixing, all that is occurring, that is hyperactive. Later on, it becomes a destructive lesion that is hypoactive. So, initially when it is a hyperactive lesion, it will be towards the side. Later on, when it becomes hypoactive, it is towards the normal side. Is that clear? So, that is why meniors is usually never asked from you. So, this is, I mean the nystagmus, the type of nystagmus or direction. In meniors will not be asked, but rest all are asked and have been asked. So, here, yes, while performing a calvary test in any person, what type and direction of nystagmus would you expect while doing a cold water irrigation? So, calvary test means which uh, semicircular canal? What will be the type of nystagmus? Horizontal or vertical? Yes, it will be horizontal. Direction with cold water, cold makes the labyrinth hyperactive, warm makes it hyperactive. In cold, what happens? We become hyperactive. In warm, we become hyperactive. Yes. So, in cold, cold is a hyperactive lesion. So, nystagmus will be towards the always opposite side. Warm is a hyperactive lesion. So, nystagmus is always towards the same side. That is what is cows. That is what is you always remember. Caloric test, you remember cows. Yes. So, with cold water, it is towards the opposite side. So, horizontal nystagmus to opposite side. So, coming back to this question, 
diagnostic maneuver was done and in the diagnostic maneuver there was upbeating nystagmus to right side so which is the canal involved upbeating nystagmus so it is posterior semicircular canal can be anterior also anterior semicircular canal is very very rare most common is posterior semicircular canal followed by horizontal so we will take the most common and that is posterior semicircular canal so here posterior semicircular canal and nystagmus is to the right side this is a hyperactive lesion so it means that the right side is hyperactive so of the right side Is that clear? Any doubts in this? Okay, so that is how you will approach the nystagmus of vertigo. So, what treatment will you give to this patient and can it recur? Yes, so posterior semicircular canal, BPPV, we will give a place maneuver. Yes, a place maneuver is a repositioning maneuver to bring back the otolith into the utricle and can it recur? Yes, it does recur. Why? Because you bring it back the autolith, you bring it back to the utricle, but it does not go and attach there again. It is still free floating. So, if there is again any uh, abnormal movement of the head, it can recur. So, coming to the next question, patient presents with sudden onset vertigo associated with nausea and vomiting for the past two days. Two days. Vertigo is continuous and she has not been able to be out of bed for two days. There is no other complaint. Now, especially I see that whenever there is vertigo in any question, you start getting vertigo. Yes. So, that is why I have included these questions here so that you know how to approach a patient of vertigo. So, that next time you get a patient of vertigo, only the patient is vertiginous and not you. Yes. So, whenever there is a patient of vertigo, I told you that. What you have to see is whether it is associated with hearing loss or whether there is no hearing loss. Yes. So, in this patient, there is a sudden onset vertigo. There is nausea and vomiting and it has been for two days continuously. Okay. It is not episodic vertigo. In BPPV, it is episodic. The vertigo is continuous and there is no other complaint. Means no hearing loss, which means that patient has only vertigo. So, what did I tell you? If there is only vertigo, what is your DD? Yes. Uh, what is your more localized DD? Yes, it is either a BPPV or it is a vestibular neuritis. If I ask you DD, you know, DD, you can make a lot of differential diagnosis. Anything of vertigo, you can say it can be a DD. But when you have to localize further, you rule out that this cannot be, this cannot be, this cannot be, and then you come down to a uh, one or two thing or three things maximum. Yes. So what is the if it is asked? What is the differential diagnosis? Yes. So if we talk about differential diagnosis, there can be many things. Yes, as I have told you earlier also, it can be BPPV, it can be vestibular neuritis, it can be menias, labyrinthitis, paralymphatic fistula, superior semicircular canal, dehiscence, it can be acoustic neuroma. Acoustic neuroma, usually they do not present with vertigo, they present with sensorineural hearing loss, but rare case might have, might present with a little imbalance along with hearing loss and very, very important is cerebellar stroke. Cerebellar stroke usually will present with Cranial nerve involvement also, intracranial features also, but many a times early cerebral stroke will not have any of those features and neither the MRI will show anything and the only complaint that the patient will have is vertigo. So that comes, so you always have to remember that when there is vertigo, only vertigo, it can be PPPV. Here the vertigo is episodic. Yes, it can be vestibular neuritis. Vestibular neuritis, it is a continuous vertigo and this vestibular neuritis continuous vertigo matches very much with the cerebellar vertigo, vertigo because of cerebellar stroke that is also continuous. So, these two you have to rule out whenever the patient has only vertigo and it is a continuous vertigo. Now, when we further localize our diagnosis, we know it cannot be a BPPV because it BPPV always the vertigo is episodic on posture change. That is totally ruled out. Here the patient has a continuous vertigo for two days. The patient has not been out of bed. Yes. Now, if we talk about we have made so much of differential diagnosis. So, can we rule out them? Yes, we can very easily rule them out. Why? You already know. Menias, labyrinthitis, paralymphatic fistula, superior semicircular canal, dehiscence, acoustic neuroma. All of them will have hearing loss also. Right. The character of the vertigo also will be totally different. If we are talking about continuous vertigo. Continuous vertigo. Does menias have continuous vertigo? Yes or no? Yes, it can have continuous vertigo. It there is continuous vertigo, but it is not 
never less than 20 minutes, never more than 24 hours and here what is it? It is for 2 days. So, then Meniere's is ruled out, yes. So, Meniere's is otherwise also ruled out because there is no hearing loss. But, in, because in this patient there is, uh, the hearing loss is not there, yes. But otherwise also, if we just talk about vertigo, okay, in these things, all these conditions that I marked out, there is hearing loss. Just forget about hearing loss. Just let us try to rule out whether this can be, uh, this presentation can be all these things just by the basis of vertigo. Yes, here, how is the vertigo? Vertigo is continuous. It's been for two days. Yes. So, can it be meniere's vertigo? Can it be BPPV? No, it cannot be. That is episodic on posture change for few seconds. Cannot be. Meniere's, meniere's vertigo never lasts for more than maximum 24 hours. This cannot be. Yes. It is 24 hours. Labyrinthitis, labyrinthitis vertigo can be, can occur Labyrinthitis means inflammation of the labyrinth. Yes, inflammation of the labyrinth will immediately not subside. So, yes, it has continuous vertigo and that happens till the time the labyrinth completely uh, recovers or it, it becomes totally dead. Like it, the compensation occurs till that time it will be there. So, it is going to be there for few days to it can continue for few weeks also. So, yes, that, that can be there in this patient. But this patient cannot be labyrinthitis because there is no hearing loss. Labyrinthitis has to have hearing loss. In perilymphatic fistula, can the vertigo of perilymphatic fistula be continuous? Any fistula, be it a fistula of the oval window, round window, lateral semicircular canal, or be it a superior semicircular canal dehiscence. That is also fistula, but over the superior semicircular canal covering, bony covering. So, in all these cases, whenever there is vertigo, the vertigo is all, always during either uh, pressure changes or loud sound. Pressure changes, yes. Whenever there is pressure changes, that will excessively stimulate the inner ear. Loud sounds will excessively stimulate the inner ear, lead to abnormal movement in the inner ear, leading to vertigo. So, what is that known as? Vertigo on loud sound, Tullius phenomena. Vertigo on pressure changes, yes, Hennebert sign. So, in those cases, the type of vertigo is induced by pressure changes, by loud sounds. That is what is known as Tullius or Hennebert, whether it is a perilymphatic fistula, whether it is superior semicircular canal dehiscence. Is that clear? So, by all this, we can rule out that it is not any of these conditions. And we are now narrowed down to two things. Either it can be vestibular neuritis, continuous vertigo for two days. It can be cerebellar stroke, early cerebellar stroke. Yes. And early is what is important. Why? Because the patient still is in the window period where if you, if it is a cerebellar stroke, you can control it that time and you can prevent the further damage of the uh, of the uh, intracranial damage to occur. So, now let us see what has been asked next. So, what is the likely diagnosis? Okay, we have narrowed down our diagnosis to either vestibular neuritis or cerebellar stroke. What do you think is the diagnosis? So, what will be your next step? So, now our next step will depend upon what our um, differential diagnosis, what have we have narrowed down, what we have to differentiate between. We have to differentiate either between a vestibular neuritis or a cerebellar stroke. And there is no other finding other than vertigo that has been apparent that is apparent by the history. So, what now? Yes, we know that whether it is a peripheral cause, vestibular neuritis or a central cause, cerebral stroke, we can find out by looking at the nystagmus and these patients usually will have spontaneous nystagmus. So, yes, we will look at the nystagmus. So, next step is look at the nystagmus, find nystagmus. So, Yes, you look for nystagmus and what you found out was that there was, there is a horizontal nystagmus with slow component to the left. What is the direction of nystagmus in this patient? This is the first thing that is asked. What? Slow component is to the left. So, what is the direction? Yes, in one of your questions, it was mentioned like the slow component is to the left and diagnosis was asked, which year? Yes. So, you think, okay, slow component is to the left, direction is towards this side, you forget to find that out. Direction is always the fast component. So, if the slow component is to the left, fast component is to the right. So, direction is towards the right, which means that if I decipher the nystagmus of this patient, the patient has a right-sided horizontal nystagmus. Yes. So, can you tell me if it is a horizontal nystagmus, can it be a vestibular neuritis? Complete destruction of labyrinth? Yes. Of which side? If the nystagmus is towards the right, means right is the more active. So, which is the involved side? Left. So, the diagnosis will be left vestibular neuritis. Why not cerebellar stroke? Yes, here what is given is the direction is given. There is slow component. 
towards the left in cerebellar condition in central involvement the direction of nystagmus is not fixed it is sometimes towards the right sometimes towards the left so if the direction has been mentioned direction is this means that it is a fixed direction so if the direction is fixed it means that the pathology is a peripheral vestibular pathology so then we had two dd vestibular neuritis and cerebellar stroke so now our diagnosis is vestibular neuritis because it is a fixed direction and which side yes we have the direction is towards the right so that is the normal side more active side so it is a left vestibular neuritis am i right i mean you can also tell me maybe i'm wrong right thank you okay so on examination horizontal nystagmus with slow component to the left what is the diagnosis we made the diagnosis is a vestibular neuritis of the left side vestibular neuritis left side so we have another question here what will be the effect of optic fixation on the nystagmus of this patient yes so this is also when you are testing for nystagmus when you are testing for spontaneous nystagmus when you uh, your direction will tell you the there are many other things that will tell you one of which very very important is optic fixation you ask the patient to fix the eye to something and you see whether nystagmus continues or disappears if it disappears on optic fixation it means it is peripheral or central it means it is peripheral okay so latency in peripheral will be present duration will be limited fatigability will be present what is fatigability if the nystagmus starts and dies after after some time is that fatigability no that is duration then what is fatigability fatigability means repeatability is not there you test once you get nystagmus you test again nystagmus is not there yes so you for bppv you are testing and you did the dix hall pack maneuver and you got a very nice nystagmus now you want to call your colleagues and you want to show that see such a nice nystagmus and tell me which canal is involved or tell me which side is involved and you do the test no nystagmus so was it a illusion hallucination that you were having earlier no this is a peripheral nystagmus peripheral nystagmus has the characteristic of fatigability vertical or horizontal with the torsion whenever torsion is there it means it is peripheral optic fixation nystagmus will disappear it means it is peripheral and direction is always fixed and it is towards the more active side is that clear and these are something very very basic clinical aspects of vertigo of nystagmus which each one of you should know it should be on your fingertips and i'm sure it is so starting with the next question a 35 year old male presents to the opd with a complaint of nasal obstruction on the right side right sided severe facial pain over the cheek area he also reports yellowish nasal discharge from the right nostril and decrease sense of smell okay his symptoms started 8 days back with fever and running nose which he thought will subside by its own but his symptoms have worsened over the past 3 days to the present condition what is your probable diagnosis okay so what is the diagnosis so what are we here with we have a patient who has nasal obstruction he has nasal discharge he has facial pain and he has hyposmia decrease sense of smell right yes so all these are the symptoms which are the typical symptoms of yes sinusitis and to be more specific it is rhino sinusitis what we call it as because the infection always goes from the nose to the sinus sinuses so rhino sinusitis is that all or will you like to add on something to my diagnosis is it just a rhino sinusitis can i say or something more okay tell me acute or chronic is that not important yes will the management of if it is acute or if it is chronic differ yes so whenever we are making a diagnosis we are making a diagnosis to treat the patient so to treat the patient we have to have the more accurate diagnosis yes whether it is acute or chronic yes so it is the duration is of 8 days 8 days right so if it is 8 days it is acute or chronic yes less than 12 weeks is acute more than 12 weeks is chronic so this is acute rhino sinusitis and if i ask you that which sinus will you also be able to add that here which sinus tell me see the question again tell me which sinus where is the pain yes pain is over the cheek area so which sinus acute maxillary 
sinusitis, maxillary rhinosinusitis, yes or no? Do we not read, do we not remember pain over the cheek area is in which pain over the uh, root of eye, yes, pain increased with movement of eye, pain early in the uh, pain early morning. We read all that. Why? Yes, so that when, when the patient gives us all this history, we can come to a diagnosis, most accurate diagnosis. Yes, yes. So now tell me if what are the facial pain characteristics? If there is pain or tenderness over the root of nose, medial, and deep to eye. Yes, deep to eye. Eye. So that is which sinusitis? Ethmoid. If pain increases with eye movement, again it is ethmoid. Why? Because the ethmoid is separated from the orbit by a thin papery bone, lamina papyracea. Pain tenderness over frontal area, very easy, frontal sinusitis. Early morning headache, office headache, periodic headache, early morning headache, yes, the secretions collect here when the patient lies down. When he gets up because of gravity, drainage occurs, headache is gone. That is frontal sinusitis. Pain tenderness over the cheek and upper jaw, yes, that is maxillary. Occipital headache, that is seen in sphenoid. Yes, we do remember all this. So, when there is a chance to Express your knowledge that yes, this is maxillary sinusitis. Why not? Yes. So, do it. So, here we have made the diagnosis of right sided acute maxillary rhino sinusitis, right? And uh, what will you prescribe any investigation to confirm your diagnosis? Diagnosis is acute. In acute sinusitis, will you prescribe any investigation? Tell me, you tell me, this is, this presentation is something which I don't think anybody of you would have never ever had till now. This presentation, I don't think you all must have not treated for your family members, your friends, yes, you have. So did you look for all these features? Did you look for the number of days? Did you look for the area? And did you get some investigation done to diagnose if it was an acute, an acute sinusitis? No. We, it is a, just a clinical diagnosis. It is a clinical diagnosis. Maximum, you can go for endoscopic examination. But there is no need of usually any investigation. Just by symptoms, just by interior rhinoscopic examination, you can go, you can come to the diagnosis. Yes. So, one of your friend is in favor of prescribing antibiotics while the other wants to just give symptomatic treatment for some days, what is your take on this? What treatment will you prescribe to this patient? Will you prescribe antibiotic to this patient? If yes, why? Which antibiotics? If no, why? Yes. So, also write a prescription for this patient. Nice. Okay. So, tell me, will you prescribe antibiotic or not? Yes. Many a times, you yourself, you... Uh, you have these symptoms and you are not sure whether to take antibiotic or not. So, when will you think that this antibiotic has to be given or antibiotic should not be given? Yes, we know that acute sinusitis can be viral, it can be bacterial. So, what are the symptoms that will point that this is bacterial? So, if it is bacterial, you will give antibiotics, right? So, what were the symptoms? Symptoms were nasal obstruction, nasal discharge, facial pain and decreased sense of smell, right? So, if out of these, if the nasal discharge is discolored, discolored, yes, if it is unilateral predominance, same if the facial pain, pain, facial pain, facial pressure, facial fullness is very severe and if it is unilateral preponderance, along with this, if there is increased ESR, there is fever, temperature more than 38 degrees C. Or along with this, if there is double sickening, what's the meaning of double sickening? Double sickening means that the patient felt that he was improving, but suddenly his symptoms started worsening. Like in this in this patient, what was the symptom? Yes, he had eight days back, he had the symptoms and he thought he was improving, but for the past three days, the symptoms have worsened and he is having all this. Yes. So, if out of these one, two, three, four and five it out if out of these any three is also present it is indication of bacterial pathology so tell me in this patient will you give antibiotic this patient has severe facial pain so one is there okay yellowish nasal discharge so discolored nasal discharge and also that is unilateral predominance yes severe facial pain also right sided unilateral predominance there is double sickening worsened over the past three so three features are there 
So it indicates this is a bacterial pathology. So will you give antibiotics? Yes, in this patient, antibiotics is indicated. Write your prescription, right? Okay. What have you written? Show me your prescription. Did you write like this? Antibiotic. That's it. Which antibiotic? Against which organism? So, acute sinusitis, what is the organism? Yes, it is streptococcus, streptococcus pneumoniae, or it is H influenza or Moraxella catralis. Most commonly, it is these three. So, any antibiotic against these three, streptococcus pneumoniae, yes, it can be. Tell me, your pharma is so nice, I know that, yes. So, which antibiotic? Yes, you can give a moxiclab, you can give third generation cephalosporin, you can give, you can give second generation. Uh, uh, second generation cephalosporin. Yes, so you can give all this amoxiclav, cephiroxine, yes, third generation cepodem. So you can give so many antibiotics here. And will that only suffice antibiotic or anything else? What will your prescription be like? Just any of these antibiotics, is that all? So what is this patient having? Yes, the patient is having nasal obstruction. So for that, what will you give? So your pres prescription will be antibiotic, okay. You can give whichever choice you have, okay, of which covers these organism. It will be, will you give for nasal obstruction decongestants? Yes or no? Yes, decongestants. But for not for more than maximum, yes, maximum 5 to 7 days, it can lead to rhinitis, medicamentosa. Anything else? Patient has facial pain, pressure. What for that? Yes, analgesics. You, if you just give antibiotics and you send the patient, a patient will never come back to you again. Why? Because the next day he will go to some other doctor. Why? Yes, because he is disturbed. He is not bothered whether he has infection or not, and that infection is being taken care of not of or not. The patient is disturbed because of the pain, because of nasal obstruction. If you do not relieve that till the time infection is taken care of, patient will. Yes, feel that you have not given the correct treatment. So, you have to give decongestant, you have to give an alge 6. And yes, uh, very, very important is saline spray. Saline spray will increase the mucociliary clearance and that will, uh, that will uh, accelerate the healing and it will prevent the acute to go into chronic. And if it is very, very severe, so nowadays, all the books, be it Cummings, be it Scott Brown, they recommend that if the symptoms are very severe, even a short course of intranasal steroid spray can be given in acute sinusitis also if it is very severe. Why? Because in acute sinusitis, our aim is, yes, not only recovery, but also prevention of the infection to go into chronic. And what is the cause of, yes, many times you ask me that it is a infection, bacterial infection, we are giving steroids. Yes. So, why are nasal steroids given, be it acute sinusitis or chronic sinusitis, in fact, in chronic sinusitis, the main management, medical management that is given initially is the intranasal steroid. Why? Because what is the cause here? The cause is that the sinuses get blocked. The sinuses opening have got blocked. Why? Because of inflammation. So, the intranasal steroids will reduce the inflammation, be it acute or be it chronic. And it will restore the ventilation and drainage. And if the ventilation and drainage is restored, then the chances that uh, this, whatever the condition the patient is having, which has led to this obstruction and inflammation of the sinuses, will it will recover. So, that is why intranasal steroids are always indicated in sinusitis, chronic, it is always in acute, if it is very severe, it can be given, right? It can be, it is not that always you have to give. So, yes, your prescription will look something like this. So, coming to the next question, a 25-year-old female, 25-year-old complains of persistent right-sided nasal obstruction, hyposmia for 5 months. She gives a history of paroxysmal episodes of sneezing, mostly in the morning and running nose which was watery throughout the day, which started some years back when she, since she went to college. Her nasal endoscopy shows the following finding in the right nostril. So, this patient has right-sided nasal obstruction and hyposmia. It's 5 months, means it is chronic. And patient has paroxysmal episodes of sneezing in the morning, running nose, all these features of allergy or atopy, you can call it. And endoscopy is showing, what is endoscopy showing? Endoscopy is showing polyps. 
So, what is the differential diagnosis? What is the differential diagnosis? Yes, so whenever we read polyps also, I told you that how do you have to remember polyps? You have to remember under two categories, whether it is seen in adult or whether it is in a child or whether it is bilateral or unilateral, right? Adult, when it is bilateral, what are the things you will think of? Adult unilateral, what are the things you will think of? Child bilateral, what you have to rule out? Child unilateral, what you have to rule out, right? Now, here we are having adult, we are having adult and we are having bilateral unilateral only in the right side okay so we are having unilateral so when it is adult and unilateral what will be a first differential diagnosis yes it can be allergic fungal sinusitis it can be bacterial rhinosinusitis now both these are adult and both these lead to unilateral usually though rarely it can be bilateral also now other uh, conditions which can lead to polyps in adult can be allergy can be Aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease, which is Samter's triad, which is aspirin induced, nasal polyps, and asthma. Triad of all this, all triad of these three is what is Samter's triad. And we can have Chuck Strauss syndrome, which is a granulomatous condition of vasculitis of the small and medium vessels, eosinophilic vasculitis, where patients present with adult onset asthma, and the age of presentation is usually 50 years. They will have asthma, they will have features of chronic sinusitis, of polyps, yes. So now here, Chuck Strauss syndrome around 50 years and it's not a very common condition. We will not think of that. There's no history of aspirin sensitivity given here, no history of asthma also. So we can rule that out also. And out of these three, which do you think is, is this history of this female pointing towards maximum? Yes, there is also one history of allergy. So it is pointing towards, yes, it is pointing towards allergic fungal sinusitis or we can keep the other DD. Second as, second we can keep as the allergy. Yes, allergy. Okay, so these two are our DD. So she was diagnosed as allergic fungal sinusitis by her doctor who prescribed her itroconazole and nasal steroids for one month and then called for review. She has come to you for a second opinion. Okay, what findings will you look for and what tests will you ask for to confirm the diagnosis of allergic fungal sinusitis? You were also thinking it can be allergic fungal, yes? Yes, and uh, the doctor is also diagnosed as allergic fungal. But is only this much allergy and nasal polyp sufficient for diagnosing allergic fungal sinusitis? For allergic fungal sinusitis, yes, when you are seeing the nasal polyps along with that, what should you see? You should see mucinous nasal discharge. You should be able to see, yes, the sticky mucinous is because of lot of eosinophils in the discharge. Yes, so mucinous nasal discharge. And you should be able to see on the, uh, when you take the fungal smear, not culture. Yes, fungal smear, just take a smear. You should be able to see the fungus there. Mostly it is because of demataceous fungi. And the CT will show the double intensity sign or the double the uh, rail track sign right this is what is known as the double density sign or it is also known as the rail track sign or the heterogeneous appearance so, yes, why is this heterogeneous appearance present because this fungus has the ability to trap metals calcium manganese iron so that appears that gives a heterogeneous appearance now here just see here also do you think that this ct is a ct of allergic fungal sinusitis we are seeing the heterogeneous appearance but can you see that there is some erosion of these areas lamina papyracea the medial wall of the orbit is what is lamina papyracea can you see some erosion can you see it is just expanding and eroding so can this be allergic fungal sinusitis yes or no yes in allergic fungal sinusitis the mucin has the expansive nature because of which it can erode so, whenever there is erosion present, it is not necessarily because of tumors, yes. So, what is important is the heterogeneous appearance. So, if the heterogeneous appearance is present, so then when you, all these are present, along with that, when the patient has a raised Ig, which indicates that the patient has a, uh, is atopic to the fungus. So, then you say that this is allergic fungus sinusitis. So, when it is asked that what are the other things that you will look for and what are the tests? So, what are the things that you will look for? You already have seen nasal polyps. You will look for mucinous discharge. You will also look for, yes, you will get the test done. Which test done? 
you will get a fungal smear done, you will get a CT scan done, you will get a blood test for IgE levels done. So, IgE level, CT scan and a fungal smear. So, if all these are met, all these criteria are met with, if you see all these only then you can say that this is allergic fungal sinusitis. These are known as the major criteria. This is Bent and Kuhn diagnostic criteria and yes all five have to be present there are some minor criteria also if present okay if not present okay but all of these five major criteria if present then we say it is allergic fungal sinusitis and if it is not present then it is not allergic fungal sinusitis then you say that maybe this patient has a allergic etiology can allergy also lead to polyps yes allergy can lead to all the the allergy allergy whether it is allergy yes all these conditions allergy aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease, chalk straws, all these are systemic conditions and systemic conditions usually lead to bilateral nasal polyps. Yes, but yes, okay, you will think of maybe this is allergy if all these things are not met with. And what difference does it make? Does it make a difference if the cause is allergy or if it is allergic fungal sinusitis? Will it make a difference in the management? Yes or no? If it is allergic fungal sinusitis, what will be your management? If it is allergy, what will be the management? If it is only allergy which is leading to uh, nasal polyps. Yes, so if it is allergic fungal sinusitis, what is the cause of polyp there? The fungus that the patient has inhaled has gone into one of the sinuses. It has gotten trapped. It is not able to come out. And this is a patient who is atopic. He is allergic to that fungus. So, he, the body is reacting severely against that fungus. There is a lot of eosinophils that are being produced leading to mucinous discharge. These mucinous discharge are so thick, they obstruct the sinuses leading to sinusitis and ultimately polyformation. So, here the main management will be removal of the foreign, the antigenic fungus. The main management of allergic fungal sinusitis will be removal by what? By fess. You have to do a fess and remove. Whereas in allergic, allergic cases, always the first management is medical management. Medical management with intranasal steroid spray, with saline spray, with so intranasal steroids, they are the main management of allergic if it does not benefit only then you go for fess in allergic patients right so that is why all these criteria when this is met then you say it is allergic fungal sinusitis and then you go for the management so the what has this doctor offered the treatment prescribed itroconazole and intranasal steroids for one month and then called for review so what is your opinion does your opinion differ regarding the management she has been prescribed if she is a patient of afs Yes. What will you give? Yes, you will go for FES. Then, in the post-operative period, very, very important in the post-operative period because these are the patients who are severely, who have been severely allergic to the fungus. Once you remove the fungus also, that area will be severely edematous. Yes, so you have to immediately restore the ventilation and drainage of the sinuses. So, post-operative period steroid is a must. Intranasal steroid in the post-operative period. And if required, a short course of systemic steroid also you can give. Yes, saline spray you have to give to increase the mucociliary clearance. And do you give antifungal here? Is there any role of giving antifungal? Antifungal is usually not required unless and until the response following surgery is very bad in leak as trend cases in very severe cases which are not responding well to surgery in those cases you can give itraconazole otherwise antifungal is not required so the next question that is asked here is will you ask for a ct scan of the nose and pns give two reasons for asking for it so will you give ask for ct scan yes or no yes first it is required for diagnosis required for diagnosis and second two reasons tell me why Second reason you think can tell me, why will you ask for a CT scan? Yes, here we know that the management is FES and is CT scan a prerequisite for FES? Yes or no? Before you do FES, is it mandatory to get a CT scan done? Yes, no. Yes, because pre-op FES you have to do. The management is FES. So, pre-op you have to get a CT scan done. Why? Why? Yes, we know this nose is, this area is a very crucial area. There are all around very important structures. So, what we say is that before FES, we take a close call by seeing the CT scan. So, what are the things that you have to see is close by taking the close call. What is C? C is the cribriform plate. Here, this here, 
what you are seeing this here is the cribriform plate yes the cribriform plate can be of varying thickness of varying distance from the uh, base of skull it can come down of varying depth so whether it is what classification whether it is just 1 to 3 millimeters or 4 to 7 millimeters or 8 to 16 millimeters this the ct scan will tell you and if it is 8 to 16 millimeters means it is so deep you have to be very careful you are going inside the nose and you think that it will be here whereas it is here you might injure the scribriform plate leading to csf leak what is l of close l is lamina papyracea so in this patient where you got the CT scan previous to surgery in AFS, you, what you are seeing is that, see here all the lamina papyracea is breached. So, if you are not careful while removing all this fungus and the debris from here, you might just injure the orbit. So, it is very, very important. L is lamina papyracea, the medial wall of the orbit is a very thin papery bone. And O is, O is, you have to look for ONOD cell. What is ONOD cell? It is a posterior model cell. Posterior model cells. How is the orientation? We have the frontal sinuses, right? We have the maxillary down. We have the anterior ethmoid, then we have the posterior ethmoid, and then more posteriorly we have the sphenoid. So just in front of the sphenoid sinuses, we have the posterior ethmoid sinuses. So if the posterior ethmoid sinuses are very pneumatized, they will go all around the sphenoid sinus. They will go superior. They will go lateral to the sphenoid sinus. And why is it important then? See here, we have the sphenoid sinus on both the sides. And the sphenoid sinuses, the sphenoid sinuses are laterally, we have the cavernous sinus here, yes. Superiorly here we have the, the pituitary fossa, here we have the optic nerve, here through the cavernous sinus passes the internal carotid artery. So, the sphenoid sinus is in close relation to internal carotid and optic nerve and many a times this bone separating the internal carotid from the sphenoid sinus is dehiscent. So, you can see the carotid pulsation also. So, when one of the, when the posterior ethmoid goes and surrounds, envelops the sphenoid sinus, now the, this cell comes in close relation to the optic nerve and to the internal carotid and it can be very easy uh, when operating while operating on these these structures the internal carotid and the optic nerve can be very easily injured so this post eighth model cells which goes to envelop this sphenoid sinus is what is known as the onod cell so you have to look for onod cell which is also known as phenoeth model cell it is a post eighth model cell which has gone and enveloped the sphenoid so it is known as phenoeth model cell and the e close e is the ethmoidal artery. So, what is the ethmoidal artery? Yes, we know that the ethmoidal artery is the branch of the ophthalmic. Ophthalmic artery will enter the eye through the uh, through the optic foramen, optic canal, and it will give the posterior ethmoidal and the anterior ethmoidal. They will enter into the nose to supply the nose, and they will when they enter. Just see how it looks like. See here from the eye, they are piercing the lamina papyracea see here this is the lamina papyracea thin bone yes so they are piercing the lamina papyracea piercing the lamina papyracea and then going through the ethmoid air cells to the cribriform plate and then from there they will come to supply the septum yes now sometimes what happens is that where they are coming is just at the roof this is a safe variety but by chance where they are coming where it is entering into the nose this produces a nipple like projection this is what is known as the nipple sign or it is known as the anti eighth model notch so where it produces where it enters into the nose suppose in this patient the ethmoids are very pneumatized ethmoids are going more superiorly as in this patient so then they will run through the ethmoid air cell now in this patient it is a very clean air cell there are no infection or debris in any of the sinuses so we can see the artery very easily we will be able to see the artery going in the mesentery we will localize it but by chance all this all these sinuses were filled with debris with polyps then yes so then you have to know exactly where you are likely to find this artery so that you will not injure it what happens if you injure it if you injure it here this artery will retract back into the orbit and i we know is a closed space bony bony boundaries all around so hematoma if it forms it will lead to compression of the optic nerve it can lead to blindness it is an emergency so that is why you have to be very very careful you have to know exactly where this artery is so these are the things close call c l o s e cribriform plate lamina papyracea ono d cells phenoid sinus and ethmoidal artery are the things that you have to see before any face and that is why 
that is another reason why in this patient you will go for a, a preoperative CT scan. So again, that is something which is very, very frequently asked and it should be very crystal clear that whenever a presentation like that is given to you, in whichever exam, how are you going to approach such a patient and what should be there in your mind, what are the things that you will rule out and how you will manage such patients. So coming to the next question, a four-year-old male child, four-year-old male child is brought to the pediatric OPD with sore throat, fever, noisy breathing, inability to swallow for the past four hours. Examination shows a toxic tachypneic child. There is suprasternal and supraclavicular intercostal recession during inspiration. The noise during breathing is also during inspiration. The child was good till last night. In turn, poster diagnosed the patient as croup and immediately started the child on nebulization with epinephrine and budicot. An hour later, the child became quiet and floppy, and within the next one hour, the child expired. Hmm. So, what is the differential diagnosis and most likely diagnosis and why? So, what are we here with? We are here with a four-year-old child, right? Four-year child and what is the complaint of the child? Child has sore throat, child has fever, child has inspiratory strider, child has difficulty in swallowing, let us call it a dysphagia. Okay, other than that, what significant child has a toxic look and all this very, very important. We can see child was good till last night. So, all this has presented acutely. What is the differential diagnosis? What are the things that you can think of? Difficulty in swallowing, strider, inspiratory strider toxic look yes so the first thing that comes to our mind is yes tell me what comes to your mind first yes epiglottitis i told you that when we make a differential diagnosis we make a broad yes broad diagnosis and then we narrow down we rule out not this not this not this so yes it can be epiglottitis is acute epiglottitis a very acute onset yes it is acute onset it is very rapidly progressive the child has a very toxic appearance, strider is inspiratory, dysphagia, drooling of saliva, difficulty in swallowing because of the uh, swollen infected epiglottis. Yes, all these features are there, epiglottitis, everything is fitting. Okay. Can it be diphtheria? Diphtheria. Diphtheria also, if it involves the larynx, there can be strider which is inspiratory, but it will not be localized only to the supraglottis. It will not be an acute onset diphtheria child. You will not see that the child develops uh, fever today and tomorrow the child will go into strider like this. No, it is slowly progressive. The child will first have features of upper respiratory tract infection, malice, and then difficulty in swallowing can be there. Later on, when the larynx involves, there can be strider, there can be cough. It will not be restricted only to. There will be bull neck. Yes, the lymph nodes will be involved. Very, very important. There will be pseudomembrane. Yes, there will be pseudomembrane. So, all these things, if present, then we can say that it is diphtheria. But one thing which is not, which is impo importantly pointing out that this is not looking like diphtheria is the, the rapid progression. Yes, and if it was diphtheria, some immunization history also might have been given here, which is not mentioned here. Yes. So, there can be uh, retropharyngeal abscess. Are all these things coming to your mind? Or are they coming to my mind only? Retropharyngeal abscess. Yes, very good. Yes, they are coming. More is coming to your mind. Yes. So, yes, retropharyngeal abscess. Retropharyngeal abscess again. Can this be retropharyngeal abscess? How does in a four year old child retropharyngeal abscess develop? Retropharyngeal abscess will occur because of usually the uh, Waldia's ring infection. Retropharyngeal space has the lymph nodes of Ruvier. Yes, they get infected because of adenoiditis. Yes, because of the Waldia's uh, ring infection. So, they again will not immediately today infected, the child looks infected and tomorrow abscess. It takes slow progression. Yes, the child will, it is never a toxic look like this. And yes, you will see a bulge on one side of the midline. Retropharyngeal space is divided in the midline into two spaces, two paramedians. So, it will be a paramedian bulge that you will see. Peritonsal abscess. What do you think? Peritonsal abscess on one side. 
So whenever there is peritonsal abscess, have you ever read that patient will develop strider? Strider? Tell me. It is a lateral, lateral bulge. So usually these patients will not develop strider and also the progression will be slow. Also there will be trismus. Yes, tonsil push medially. None of these features have been mentioned here. Yes, inspiratory strider will never be present. Such toxic look on the child again will not be present. Yes, okay, can this be foreign body or angioedema? Foreign body and angioedema. They will have a cute presentation, no? Angioedema is allergic, severe allergic reaction, allergic edema of the larynx. Can that be this? Allergic reaction, will there be fever? Will there be dysphagia? Same for foreign body aspiration. It can be acute. Acute, acute inspiratory strider can be there. But can there be fever? Will there be this toxic look on the child? Yes, sore throat, all these features. No. Can it be croup? The intern has diagnosed as croup. Tell me why is it not croup? Croup, what will be the strider? Biphasic strider. Anything else that does not point towards croup? Dysphagia. Will there be drooling of saliva in croup? Croup usually involves the vocal cords and the subglottis. So, dysphagia is never a feature of croup. Cough will be there. What is the type of cough? Barking cough, also known as seal like cough. Yes, and toxic appearance. Toxic appearance is not there in croup. Such acute presentation, not there in croup. Croup usually presents with, with a slowly progressive. There will be features of malaise, fever, upper respiratory tract infection, slowly progressing to cough, then hoarseness of voice, cough, and then late will be, last will be strider. Yes, that will also be biphasic. So, out of so many differential diagnoses that we have made, we have made so many differential diagnoses and we have, yes, ruled out. This is slow progression. Torticollis will be there. What is torticollis? Stiff neck. Yes. Periton slaps is again slow progression. Diphtheria also, we just saw how the diphtheria presents. It cannot be croup also. Angiodema and foreign body also will not present like this. Yes. So, we are on to the diagnosis epiglottitis. That is a definitive diagnosis. What mistake has the intern done? Why did the child die? What should the intern have done which would have saved the life of the child? So, in other words, if there is any patient who you have diagnosed as epiglottitis, how will you manage? The first step is always, 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 strider, child is in strider, always A. A, A is airway management. Always protect the airway. How will you protect the airway? Intubation or tracheostomy? Yes, always it is preferably by intubation. Why not tracheostomy? Intubation you will require here only for two or three days. These patients, they, they recover very quickly if you give the right treatment. So, tell me the right treatment. What is the right treatment? Yes, by antibiotics. Yes, nowadays, first it was H influenza. Nowadays, the most common is strep. So, you will give antibiotics and, and fluids. Yes, IV fluids you have to give. Why? The child is not able to swallow. The, the saliva also the child is not able to swallow. The child will have, these patients will have drooling of saliva. Yes, so fluid. And if at all the strider is very severe, then in that cases you can give steroids and you can give nebulization, steroid short course and nebulization. But steroid and nebulization is never the first line management for epiglottitis. They are the first line management for croup. Yes, so what the intern mis uh, mistake the intern did was that the diagnosis was wrong. The management according to what the intern made the diagnosis was correct. If it was croup, then the management would have been nebulization. Nebulization with adrenaline, nebulization with steroids, with ste you give steroids. But sadly, the diagnosis was wrong. Diagnosis here has to be, the uh, diagnosis here is epiglottitis. So, what management should have been given to the child that we have already seen? So, with the type of questions that are being asked in NEET also nowadays and the type of questions that we are anticipating in NEXT, this was just an effort to make you realize what your approach should be whenever you see any patient. Yes, the 
you always have to go in a stepwise approach and only when you go to the stepwise approach your you, the chances are more that you will approach you will come to a correct diagnosis only when you come to a correct diagnosis the chances will be that you will give the correct treatment and that is what all of us are here for so yes there is nothing that you cannot achieve there is nothing that you cannot do if you believe that you can do it and if you work hard for it so yes always remember that never lower your goals to the level of your ability always increase your ability to reach the level of your goals so arise awake and stop not till the goal is reached